<clears throat> Hello, Echo. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, I don't know, thank you. I, I don't know, I take it day by day. I, uh, I'm not really at my best, but uh, I try to keep myself busy with, uh, <laughs> with these, um, you know, celebrations that uh, don't interest too many people, but what can we do? Let's hope a few more people will show up. Although, okay. Uh, the you know the uh, Eduardo Toroja, as you know, was an engineer, and he's not so well known here. And uh, Andre Lursa, the French architect, even less. So maybe you know that these two names will not attract a lot of people. But even if no one else shows up, if uh, it would not uh, disappoint you or bore you, I'll I'll make the presentations for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's strange. I, I don't understand this. Uh, in, um, you know, I'm part of a university with 2,300 people, and uh, I send invitations to them, but you know, they are, I don't know, unmoved. They, they, I don't think there is passion, and uh, this is very, very sad, I think. But. <coughs> Even when I gave lectures in an auditorium, meaning physically, even then, um, you know, people come only if they are forced to come. They, uh, I don't know. I hope in Indonesia is uh, not the same way. Uh, okay. Since the COVID-19, there are so many webinars, many online presentations. I think your presentations are the best, I think. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You For are architecture, yes. I like them. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, but uh, again, what is strange is that, uh, you know, it's it's almost impossible for me to, to wake up the students. You know, very few, like Julia, who is here now, but she is one of the very few Hello. Out of 2,000 students, you know, if, if I get five or seven students, I am very happy. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what they think. I don't know what they feel. I don't know why they don't understand that if they, if they don't know, if they, you know, important names in architecture and in culture in general, they cannot progress. Uh, it's beyond me how they don't understand this because they remain at an inferior level of... Uh, you know, personal de development and implicitly the, um, you know, the, um, you know, uh, work will not have uh, the desired impact on society. So they prefer to remain at, a, uh, at an inferior level, you know, uh, I don't understand them. I keep saying it, I do not understand them. Because now we are forced by pandemic, as you know, to kind of be at home. It's vacation time. So they do have the time and they are home probably, many of them. Mm. But they prefer to do I don't know what, watch TV or, uh, you know, play games or I, it's not, I, I don't understand. But anyway, we are already five people. This is a good, uh, a good number. And I thought because I was today, I actually I'm not so well prepared. I, I, I got disappointed and this happens to me now uh, very often and is annoying. I had a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation on uh, Eduardo Toroja because I lectured on him uh, two or three years ago, but I couldn't find it. Um, I think I'm afraid I lost it because I, when I went to Vienna with um, many students in architecture, I lost um, a USB stick with, you know, uh, mm. with the presentation. Sorry to hear that. So I had to, I had to make another one um, from yesterday to today, and I did. And mm. on Lursa, uh, Andre Lursa, I didn't have one. I knew of him, but I never lectured on him. So I had to prepare, and it's very difficult because he is not so well known, and it's hard to find information. But I. Uh, I managed to make two PowerPoint presentations on both, but I thought of uh, starting today um, 
because I always like to offer some surprises uh, with two contemporary architects, one from Spain, because Eduardo Toroja was from Spain, but a mm. contemporary architect and uh, very interesting and uh, a French architect also who actually works in Southeast Asia, uh, I'm not sure where, which country, but he is very interesting and very provocative. So um, I will start with, um, with the short presentations on these two contemporary architects and then we'll go to Eduardo Toroja, uh, the, the great um, uh, Spanish uh, engineer architect, because he was an architect, although he was uh, trained as an engineer, uh, but aesthetics were very important to him and uh, and he gave, he had so he built some great buildings and andre lursa who was also very interesting and he was a contemporary of le corbusier and at the time when le corbusier in the 20s 1920s was was beginning to make waves for himself um lursa also built some uh, uh, interesting buildings but then he had, um, you know, the, the idea to go to the Soviet Union and work for a few years in the Soviet Union. And this uh, ruined, in a way, his career. He returned to, to France after a few years. But um, then the war started. And uh, anyway, the, there was a gap between his successful uh, career in the 20s, early 30s, and then after 45, he started to build again, but very socially oriented. And I think this was a good idea and good, uh, good work, but not spectacular because there were, you know, just, um, you know, uh, needed much needed social housing after, after the war in Europe. So we have two interesting people, uh, Eduardo Toroja, an engineer who did some aesthetically very, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, impressive actually works. And then André Lursa, who chose the path of, of, uh, of the less spectacular, and, uh, but, but socially very significant. So anyway, I will start because uh, there is no reason to wait for, uh, for Godot, as Samuel Beckett would say, you know, the, the mass of students from, from the university here is impossible to wake up. It's, I don't know what can be done. I tried every day, I, I send messages and, uh, you know, yesterday I, I sent a message to many students asking them, I, telling them for Doshi, uh, Le Corbusier was a guru and Louis Kahn was a yogi because that's what he declared. And I asked them, who is your guru and who is your um, yogi? And only one student uh, replied. He said, my guru is um, Rem Kolhas and my, <clears throat> you know, very predictably and very, uh, and my yogi is um, uh, Ingels, Barke Ingels, Ingels. Mm. And, uh, but there was only one student um, who answered and I replied to him, I said, okay, I understand we are talking about two very well-known architects today but i asked them i asked him i said isn't the guru and the yogi uh, uh, spiritually uh, um, also um, uh, very um, how to say uh, you know you cannot you cannot neglect the spiritual side of a guru and even more of a yogi because you know, the, the, their activities were charged um, spiritually also. And uh, I asked him, well, where do you see, you know, spirituality in Rem Kolhas and uh, Ingels? And, uh, you know, he replied something, but not really to my question. The thing is, I think it is an important difference. Now, maybe there isn't a lot of spirituality, maybe in Le Corbusier either, there was more in Louis Kahn, perhaps, but uh, there was. Uh, I, I personally think they were they were um, a different kind different kind of architects than than the ones that we call stars today, because the ones that we call stars today are um, not all of them, but some of them are very mundane, and um, 
because I think uh, capitalism had a, you know, uh, the genius of understanding that the best way to annihilate the avant-garde is to, to purchase them, to buy them. And, and uh, so they bought, they bought um, uh, Rem Kolhas, uh, they bought uh, Ingels, they gave them a lot of, uh, uh, you know, commissions. They are immensely successful. Uh, it depends what we mean by successful. Um, they, uh, they, they achieved, uh, you know, a status and they are adulated by many architects and, uh, you know, they are even rich. You know, Zaha Hadid had her own plane and uh, not to speak about other things. So we are dealing with a different kind of avant-garde while um, Le Corbusier struggled. He struggled and he struggled until the end of his life. And he didn't have, uh, you know, uh, riches and so on. And, and Khan also struggled. In fact, Khan, when he died, his wife had to sell the furniture in his office because he, uh, he was bankrupt. Although he was probably the most important architect of his time when he died in early 70s, but he was very poor because he paid his employees uh, for more hours than uh, his clients paid him for. And uh, so anyway, we, we are dealing with a different, uh, a different phenomenon. Today, Kolhas and Ingels, uh, they, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they, they, they are stars, while Le Corbusier and Kahn were not considered stars. And in fact, they were even, you know, irritating society. At the end of his life, uh, Le Corbusier was proposed to, by the, the French Academy, to offer him a, a place in the French Academy, and he refused. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, so he, there was a friction, there was a tension, there was even war between them not so much Khan, but uh, Le Corbusier was uh, an irritating uh, architect. While the ones today, they are not irritating at all. They, and, and they are applauded by society. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the so-called guru um, Rem Kolhas has a Maserati or a Lamborghini, you know, the expensive high-speed cars. And, uh, you know, they build for Prada, I'm talking about Kolha. So it's a different kind of so-called avant-garde. For me, Kolha and, and Ingels are not really avant-garde, exactly because they, they, um, they lost that, that um, disagreement in a way with a, with a less than working aspects of life and society. And, uh, this was always um, a tradition with the, the avant-garde to have a, you know, an opposition to, to, you know, a resistance. Anyway, enough with this. I will start with, as I said, the subject today is Eduardo Torroja, the great Spanish architect, uh, engineer, but I was not wrong when I said architect. He was an engineer, but he achieved beauty. So as such, he was an architect. And André Lursa, uh, less known uh, French architect, but, but who at the time when Le Corbusier was building Villa Savoie, uh, Lursa also built some interesting buildings. And so he's worth remembering, I think, and, and, and learning from. But before I talk about Toroja and um, Eduardo Toroja and André Lursa, I want to show you two contemporary architects uh, one Spanish and one French. So if I talk later about the Spanish architect engineer and the French architect, I will start with two contemporary and still rather young uh, um, and, and, and very interesting architects today. So let me start first with a, a, an interview in the Greg Lynn show with this Spanish architect, uh, whom uh, maybe you know of him, and then I'll show him, I'll show you a villa he built in, um, in Spain, which is very interesting. So just a second, please. Before uh, you arrived here, I was playing some interesting music called Pierre Sacre, Sacred Stones, 
by um, uh, a very interesting composer uh, who is in Paris, but he was born in Romania. And uh, the, the kind of music uh, he, he makes is called um, um, spectral music. But let me start with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the interview that I, I, I mentioned. So the Greg Lynn show, okay, this one. So this is the Spanish architect I will talk you uh, I'll talk about. Greg, I brought some instructions from you about the city architecture. Thank you. Yeah, we poured water all over the uh, guest list. So Enrique, um, there's a lot to talk about with the digital. I think what's uh, <clears throat> most important that I didn't realize is that you were the contractor for Villeneuve. That's a good point, yeah. Uh, if you send your drawing to the builder, and the builder to the structural guy, then the guy to the skin developer, then the guy to the bricks, then the guy to the machine, then the guy, what do you get? You get something like a lost in translation design. Do I get one of these? Filling it up right now. No, oh, that's mine. Absolutely. Now you don't want to drink what's in that. Um, so you get something that is not, uh, so at the end, finally, we were sending our files to the machine directly. So it was our job to design it, but at the same time to plot it. And uh, sometimes there were some Saturday mornings, the machines were not being used. So we were using these moments and sending files, like instead of emails, but files. And then you get what you get. And then the client gets 100% of what you deliver, not a loss in translation. Yeah, and that goes for the steel structure, for, for all aspects of the building, you were coordinating all that. Yeah, yeah, that goes to, to uh, because if you do have a quite a good conversation with your clients, you do have a quite a good relationship with them, the dialogue builds this. People think that I'm crazy and I did this, but I didn't do it. So it happened as a conversation with them. Then we were finding and trying to find some builder who could understand this conversation and there isn't. So at the end, you have to map all these machines, tools, technologies to build this dream. Okay. Complex dream. Would you do it again? I would do it again. Yeah. I so you'd be happy to get rid of the middleman? Uh, no, they have to be on board uh, because these machines belong to people. Yeah. But you have to stress, for example, the carpenter didn't know what he was doing. That was his power. If he would have known what he was doing, then he would have sent us an email. Then we would have a meeting. Then I would have to uh, start to convince him. And then the lost in translation moves again and again. So rather have people operating aligned with you, yes, but without much understanding, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a bit better. Mm -hmm. no. And uh, for you, the projections of apertures. I mean, it seems like the design oh, yeah, yeah. process extended also for you. There was a benefit that you could continue designing longer, let's say, because you were in that role. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, strategy means um, normally when you do a design and then you, end, you, you wait that the output happens at the end, then you wait four or five years to get there. As a stage designer, what we learn from theater is that the output should be now, quickly. So we were doing like, okay, let's do the woodwork, and it has to be successful. It has to produce an added value in three months from now. And then another thing. So instead of a graphic that added value shows up at the end, rather do steps by step, layers by layers. And then we were wrapping up like the ceramic, the steel, and every time we were like freezing and stopping for a second, works, it's beautiful, and, and then when you have this kind of balance, you have to introduce some artist that breaks the balance again. So we were doing these layers and layers. So art is beautiful, then get an artist. Artists are very chaos and it's great. Mm. They break it, they blah, 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 blah. another mess. Let's organize the mess. Bah, 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 bah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I still do it. I still do it. All projects are done this way. And, and of course, the Villanus was the first one. That's true. And uh, all the patents uh, are produced there. And... Uh, 
I'm sorry, I, I stopped it because you can watch it at home if you want and maybe in a more, uh, you know, convenient way. And sometimes I have a feeling, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so please let me know if I'm wrong. I don't, I don't want, I, 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 feel, I feel a very long uh, or longer uh, videos uh, could be a little bit uh, uh, boring. But this Spanish architect, and I will show you the villa that he was talking about, which is a very interesting building. And by the way of Eduardo Toroja, we'll see a building built today also by a Spanish architect. So allow me please to uh, begin with a, a presentation of, of this villa by this architect. Uh, just a second, because I think I have to activate again the, uh, the share screen, okay. All right. Uh, I hope you see the PowerPoint presentation and uh, it is not a long presentation. I just want you to see this uh, building which I discovered myself uh, rather uh, recently. So this is the name of the architect that you saw in the video, Eric Ruiz Jelly, if I pronounce well. And uh, this, is, uh, this is him, you saw him in the video. Uh, by the way, that Greg Lynn show, uh, there are, I think, uh, 11 uh, such uh, shows. They are not long, 10, 12 minutes, uh, interviews or dialogues with, um, you know, very important so-called, uh, you know, not so-called, uh, well-known or important architects today. Now, he was talking about Villa Nerbs, where he was also the contractor, not just the architect. But you will be surprised, as I, I, as I was surprised, I think, when you are going to see it. This is the building. This is the building that he built uh, a few years ago. And he used uh, um, digital techniques extensively, but there is more to it. Uh, I discovered this uh, building when I was uh, preparing, and I have a PowerPoint presentation on architecture and clay. Here he uses ceramic tiles you can see them attached to the skin, uh, the envelope of the building. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very interesting building. And I think the value of, uh, of uh, ceramic tiles um, cannot be overestimated in architecture. I think ceramics and, you know, uh, implicitly clay can bring uh, to architecture something that without it or them uh, maybe, uh, um, you know, the results would not be so interesting. So cre he created this module, which is a ceramic tile and, uh, um, you know, suspended uh, uh, on, on, on the facade of the building. But the building itself, I think, is very interesting. And I was really surprised when I discovered it because um, I'm familiar with a rationalist uh, approach to architecture by Spanish architects in general. This is a different kind of architecture, of course. So, you know, we'll see Eduardo Toroja. Eduardo Toroja was very uh, creative in his own time. We live now, uh, you know, almost 100 years later. And uh, I think a dialogue between the present and uh, even the more recent past is necessary and important. So I think we see one of the most uh, innovative uh, buildings of the recent past in this building. It's very rigorous, it's organic, uh, but it's also somehow, you know, space age. And you see, you know, uh, I mean, he manufactured all these fragments uh, in, in a, such a rigorous way. And then, you know, but the result, I mean, look how he worked. He, of course, he worked digitally in a very complex way. And you couldn't do such a building otherwise. Even during construction, the, the structure is interesting, you know, uh, at any stage of its uh, uh, erection, the building is interesting. And the process also is interesting, you know, bringing all these parts together in order to create a, a coherent whole that is um, unique and interesting and innovative and very creative. Okay, so I showed you this villa of this uh, Spanish architect. Now I'm going to show you a French architect 
by the way, of André Lursa, who is very uh, idiosyncratic, uh, very uh, provocative. He is co considered the, the enfant terrible of, uh, of uh, contemporary architecture. It is difficult to comprehend. Um, he uh, actually he is now in uh, Southeast Asia, as I said. Um, I don't know exactly which, which country, and uh, yeah, but uh, we could find out. Francois Roche. So he left France. He turned his back on on, on France, uh, although he is French and he was trained in French. And uh, his uh, website is called New Territories. You see, New Territories, and in a provocative way, he adds Laboratory of Digital Disobedience. I think that art and architecture uh, often, especially in their avant-garde manifestations, have to do with disobedience. And, uh, but there is, I think, a difference between real disobedience and uh, mimicked disobedience. In my opinion, what Rem Kolhas does is mimicked disobedience. It's not real disobedience. But, uh, um, you know, th th there, is, there is another kind of architect for whom, uh, um, you know, the discord with, uh, with society or with his time uh, is more uh, explicit and implicitly uh, more detrimental to his practice. So, Laboratory of Digital Disobedience. This is his portrait, but it's not his real portrait. It's an avatar, as he calls it. He digitally uh, uh, superimposed portraits of the people working in his office. So he got this, you know, uh, robotic, uh, you know, being uh, which who, who or she, which comprise in his, uh, in his, uh, uh, you know, his, um, uh, his being or his face, uh, all the collaborators at that time in his office when he made this. And here I found on the web another it might be that, but I'm not sure. I think the one on the right is him as he might be in the future because he's not so old. Anyway, he's a very provocative man. And if you, if you search new territories, Francois Roche, you'll understand his website is almost impossible to, to read or to comprehend. But, but I, I, I think he's, um, even for this Greg Lynn show, from which we saw that fragment, uh, you know, at the, at the very beginning, he was invited there, but he didn't show up. And uh, yes, it's his way of uh, being disobedient. Now he made a, uh, built a house in Paris, which is also very, very unique and um, you know almost disturbing. And the title of an article on this house is "I am lost in Paris." And this is the house, you know, it's, you call, you say, what are you talking about? This is not a house. Well, it is the house, a detail of the house. I don't know. I don't know exactly what these things are, but somehow similar to the ceramic tiles of the Spaniard architect that I showed at the beginning. Um, I, don't, I don't know what, what their function is. Also, uh, Francois Roche is also very digitalized and he works you know, with scripting and programming in very complex ways. So this house is in Paris, but, but this is what you see, actually. <laughs> but it is a house behind this uh, mountainous uh, green. Uh, 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 there is a house and uh, the green just, uh, you know, uh, overlaps um, uh, the building. He is doing now some interesting things in Southeast Asia, and I, I really should learn uh, either Malaysia or Indonesia. I'm not sure. Somewhere there, he's um, he found refuge from the European boredom and pretentiousness. But he is himself a, a, a very very difficult man. He claims we find wildness, so he searches for wildness, and this is a topic that um, you know maybe we should discuss about, um, you know, in the near future. Why the need for, uh, you know, uh, in a way, and I thought actually of creating or initiating a festival of, of uncivilized architecture. 
In a way, this is what it is about, finding wildness at the peak of our so-called civilization. So how would an architecture, an uncivilized architecture look like? I found this, I don't know if this word, spider net, there is a irritation, linguistic irritation, the wood, uh, if it was invented by him, it's possible. He did this in, uh, in still while in France in 2007, I think. He works a lot with the, well, with what is outside of the house. And, uh, um, you know, I just go quickly through some images. Maybe I incite you to, if you are interested to, you know, fur further investigate uh, uh, his work. He is present in all the Venice biennials and so on. He does more exhibitions than, than uh, real houses. But he also builds here and there. Maybe what we see here is not so uncivilized or so wild. It's not. But um, the plan, when you look at it, is, is kind of interesting. And then a few, a few other images from what he exhibited at the Venice Biennial, uh, you know, some kind of um, spider work in a way, you know, because it's, it's woven and it's the spider net. Um, but other architects work in this way as well. Okay, that's it. And now we go to the real, uh, so-called real subject of, of, of today's presentation. I will start with uh, Eduardo Toroja, um, the great engineer. The great engineer who uh, deserved perhaps a better uh, PowerPoint presentation than the one I made. Uh, but um, uh, I tried my best because as I told you, I, I lost I lost the one I had, but I, I still managed to have a, a good number of, of, of images here. And um, so I invited actually today uh, the engineer from who was, uh, and he is, I hope, continues to be a friend of our um, meetings on Zoom, uh, Bruce Danziger uh, from Los Angeles, who uh, is uh, an, 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 uh, in a way a cutting edge engineer to talk about himself, to talk about Eduardo Toroja, that he, he, he wrote to me that he's busy, he's, talk, he's uh, booked, so I have to talk about him myself. Uh, this is the man and you can tell he's, um, you know, serious and contemplative and uh, you know, uh, such an engineer is actually an artist. And there are such engineers, not many. There is a joke, I read it recently, that, uh, you know, in front of a glass, which is half full and half empty, the optimist says, this is a, a half full glass. Uh, the pessimist says, this is a half empty glass. And uh, the engineer says, this is, um, um, uh, this is the wrong kind of glass for the, <laughs> for the amount of, um, you know, water we have or whatever li liquid is there. Anyway, uh, so this is the engineer. This is Eduardo Toroja. He was a master of shell uh, concrete, um, uh, you know, concrete shell architecture, a definition. What is a concrete shell architecture? A concrete shell, also called thin shell, uh, concrete structure is composed of a thin shell of concrete formed in such a way as to be self-supporting, often with no interior columns or exterior buttresses. The shells are most commonly flat plates and domes. They can also take the form of ellipsoids or cylindrical sections. The first concrete shell dates back to the second century. Apparently, the, the Pantheon in Rome uh, is, is, uh, uses uh, what we call now uh, concrete shell, because the Romans knew the concrete. They had their own uh, uh, concrete. OK, so um, these concrete shapes are usually strong structures, allowing clear spans without the use of internal supports. Giving, giving an open, unobstructed interior. The use of concrete as both the form and the structure. So you see, 
it's not just structure, but it's also form. And here comes the, the aesthetical side of the work of Toroja. Can reduce both material cost and construction cost over other approaches to design and construction. As concrete is relatively inexpensive and plastic to conform to compound curves. The resulting structure may be immensely strong and safe. Now you see an aqueduct that he built. This was one of his first works, if not the first one. Uh, and I think it's very elegant in its simplicity. Um, and uh, I, th I, th I think it still stands the test of time. But you'll see very soon some, some amazing structures that he built through this technique, concrete shell. So a good engineer, sometimes at least, is not only the one who you know, tries to make things work for the architect, but also someone who himself, like in this case, has his own uh, aesthetic, aesthetical, uh, you know, uh, longings, if I can call them so. And so the engineer could elevate himself to the level of the architect. Uh, and uh, this is what he did. So this is the first work he built. And then this is a, a famous work uh, of uh, Eduardo Toroja, and it, it is uh, it is indeed uh, it deserves its fame. So the architectural project was done by two architects, but the grand stand roof was designed by Eduardo Toroja, and it is the roof that that makes it exceptional. Conceived during the tumultuous years preceding the Spanish Civil War, the Zarzuela. Hippodrome came about through a public contest some supported by Madrid's Office of Suburban Access, who hoped that the, the winning design would replace the dilapidated Hippodrome located in Paseo de la Castellana. So in order to expand the existing uh, Hippodrome, one of Madrid's main thoroughfares and the cornerstone of its growth in the 1930s it became imperative to demolish the old uh, hippodrome or hypodrome in order to make space for the Nuevos Ministerios government complex. For the new hypodrome, the planners sought out a more remote and suitable location, eventually deciding on a 115 hectare plot of land close to Monte El Pardo on the northern outskirts of Madrid where it would have the necessary space, but also be connected to the city center via public transportation. The winning entry was praised for its novel and refreshing approach to the complex project, an approach that emphasized functionality as well as rationality and struck the perfect balance between neo-regionalism and rationalism movements. A focal point for the designers was the relationship between the spectators and the horses, that they should always have visual contact to promote betting the end all, be all of the race, but not interfere in each other's spaces. The proposed design was a metallic structure that meshed well with the topography of the land. It was situated on and mixed modern abstraction with the forefront trends of the time. And here you see a test for uh, this concrete shell that Eduardo Toroja became famous for. You know, it's, it's true, it's, it's, it's supported by almost nothing. And look at the weight it is capable to carry. And, and this is the roof that uh, Eduardo Toroja built for this uh, um, uh, function. Uh, the outskirts of Madrid, I think, is uh, uh, extremely elegant. And, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, beyond architecture, but beyond, uh, sorry, beyond engineering. In a way, uh, Walter Grop, you said uh, architecture begins where engineering ends, but uh, in this case, is not true. Uh, uh, engineering becomes architecture, and maybe at its best, that's what engineering should do. It's truly very elegant, and it's not, uh, you know, uh, just a nice picture or, uh, you know, an artwork. is a is a is a real roof for a real building that that functions for the function that, that it was uh, built. Uh, the building underneath uh, perhaps was done by the, the two architects, but the roof was his. 
although there is probably some structural integrity and it's possible that the, the, the participation of the engineer was felt even at this, uh, in these parts of the building. But the building is famous for its, uh, uh, its magnificent roof, you know, which, which flies. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's amazing that this can be done with, with matter. With, uh, with concrete. So you had a dreamer, because Eduardo Toroja was a dreamer who had the knowledge to make something like this happen. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very, very elegant. Very thin uh, concrete shell. But the shape itself also is, is very poetical. And very pure. No, it is the roof that is um, exceptional. Otherwise, but the whole building has uh, clarity and, and, and uh, integrity, but the roof is, is magnificent, I think, because it almost flies. You know, you would say this is, uh, it cannot be, but it, it is, and is standing the, the test of time. And it, it kind of goes also with, with, with these running horses who are also themselves attempting to fly. So both the roof and the horse uh, attempt the impossible. Now you see a club he built in Caracas in Venezuela. Uh, it's, it's also uh, amazing because this, this engineer uh, achieved in a way the dream of many architects to make the building fly, almost fly. This is also the dream of Wolf Briggs from Kopp Himmelblau. Um, and this is a self-supporting structure. It doesn't need, you know, uh, you know additional supporting uh, elements because it is it is built to self-support itself and i think is very impressive this is uh, you know I'm, I'm sorry the resolution is not so good during construction um, this is a sketch uh, an initial sketch maybe not explicitly related to what we saw. I don't know what this was, you know, some kind of a model in the factory because we saw the build, the thing was built uh, on the site. These are the, uh, you know, the, the views, the top view and the lateral views, elevations of the, of the roof. Essentially, it is the roof that, um, that um, you know, creates uh, this, um, you know, uh, exceptionalism of the structure. So you could say he is an architect or an engineer of, uh, you know, uh, I almost said sublime roofs. Now a bus station, uh, uh, this is also beautiful, I think. I mean, maybe it was not the least expensive uh, bus station ever built. Well, it's not just, you know, it's not just a cubicle where you wait for the bus. It's a bus station, meaning uh, it has a certain complexity. But look at the, this enveloping uh, uh, roof that uh, is, uh, is um, you know, so uh, inciting and uh, interesting. It might be that uh, there was some influence of Eduardo Toroja on, on Calatrava. But somehow I have a feeling that uh, with all due respect for Calatrava, somehow I, I, I feel uh, Toroja is, is purer. Uh, and uh, very surprising, you know, this, this building is, is, I think, very interesting. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures with it. Now we see the Instituto uh, de Ciencias, Ciencias de la Construcción. Uh, this is a newer, uh, uh, I mean, you know, he built it towards the end of his life. And, but this one also has a purity and, and, and obviously uh, plastic or artistic uh, qualities. 
So, you know, you could say, where is, the, where, where is the architect here? Where is the engineer? Where is the artist? It was all three of them. And he deserved to be. Maybe you know, but Le Corbusier said, uh, I, I, I love the engineers, I, I love the painters, but I don't love the, the architects. And I ask myself why? Maybe because you know engineers and painters are in in a certain way purer, because an architect is immersed in the hybrid, uh, uh, you know, management of, of complex issues and uh, negotiations and uh, you know compromises, while the painter and the, the engineer, in their own ways, uh, follow their paths and they don't have to handle too many issues. And, 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 and this is shown even in this building, you know, for an architect it would be difficult to do something so pure. But uh, the engineer, Eduardo Toroja, uh, managed to make a functioning building with a, uh, a form of aesthetics that I think uh, um, express a, a higher uh, stance of, of, of purity. There are things here I don't, I didn't study them very carefully, but this roof is also very interesting. Uh, this, the way he covers this, um, this space. Now we see another, another work by him, um, also very pure. And you see how thin that concrete shell is, you know, and you know, it, it arrives at, you know, a, a span of 32 meters, you know, 32 and a half meters and the length is 55 meters without any support in between the, the, the sides. It is amazing. And you'll see that it looks great. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, the width is 32.5 meters and the length 55 meters. It's a, it's a large, it's a large space. So I, I think there are satisfactions in the work of a good engineer as well, and not just in the field of calculations, of making things work, but also in the field of beauty. And that's what Toroja was able to do, what he achieved and what he became famous for. Because it is impressive to see such a big interior with no supporting uh, elements and when you look at the drawings and the sections, you see how thin this uh, concrete shell is. And also the lighting is, uh, is, uh, is very appropriate and, and, and magnificent. So at, at bottom, the engineer was a poet, just as a good architect is, or is supposed to be. You see, Aesthetica and la ingenier, ingenier, Ingenieria Civil, uh, it's, it's, it's aesthetics, but also engineering. And uh, when the two meet, it's beautiful. You see, it's only eight centimeters thick, the concrete shell. Unbelievable, you know, and, 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 and this eight centimeters thick shell covers a space that is wide, uh, that is uh, 32 meters wide. Incredible. And it even has the, you know, that articulation between a larger segment of a circle and a smaller one. This is brilliant, I think. Bravo to him. Now we see a market hall. This is an early work from 1934. Maybe he built it um, uh, soon after that aqueduct that you saw. Uh, also here the roofing uh, does everything because it's again uh, uh, very generous and very, very, uh, in a way very inexpensive because uses very little material. It's uh, to do more with less. 
but that less implies a lot of um, you know inspiration and calculations and knowledge and uh, so on you see very well that here again the concrete shell is very very thin for such a large uh, building So uh, I'm approaching the end of this presentation. Let's wish him happy birthday, Eduardo Toroja. And uh, now we'll go to the French architect. So I, I, I really admire uh, Toroja. And uh, I think we can learn a lot from uh, such engineers, uh, poets. Now let's see uh, what um, André Lursa did. Uh, he's... Uh, um, an architect who is not very spectacular towards the end of his life in particular, but uh, we'll still uh, learn something from him as well. This building I saw myself with my own eyes. It, it is in Vienna, uh, in Austria. Uh, it was a Werkbund colony where um, uh, important architects from, uh, you see, 1932, uh, uh, and, and by the way, the market th that Eduardo Toroja built, uh, the last work that we saw was from 1934. So they were contemporaries um, uh, about 90 years ago. Lursa built this uh, block of flats in Vienna on top of a hill where other architects built, like Adolf Loos, um, Gary Riedveld, uh, even Hans Hartung. Uh, some interesting architects, they were asked to build very inexpensive uh, apartments or little houses, kind of like similar to what it was done in Stuttgart uh, in uh, a little earlier, 1928 or so, uh, where Le Corbusier participated and Miss van der Rohe and so on. But this is the building built by André Lursa and the fact that he was invited to Vienna in 1932 to, to, to create a building uh, for this um, colony of experimental houses shows that he was very, you know, respected and appreciated. So André Lursa, he was born in 1894, so he was, uh, you know, seven years uh, younger than, um, if I calculated well, than Le Corbusier, who was born in 1887. I'm always a little bit, either 1887 or 1878. Anyway, um, I prepared this uh, PowerPoint presentation based on the material I found on archi architecture misfit number 23. And I recommend to you, I suggest to you to look at this website because it's very interesting. Architecture misfits or misfits architecture is called, which shows uh, uh, works of uh, important architects, but less known. That's why the word misfit. And it's a, it's a good, uh, I think it's a good website and has some very interesting uh, articles. This is the man. Hello, Mr. Lusa, happy birthday to you. And uh, I'll read a little bit about him. So um, now here is something wrong. It's not three years, it's seven years after. Anyway, André Lursa was born, not three years, seven years after Charles Edouard Jean Regri. And I uh, know, uh, uh, I don't know who Charles Edouard Jean Regri is, but and died five years after Le Corbusier. No, I, but I didn't know uh, Le Corbusier was also called Gris. Anyway, there, something is wrong here. He was born. <laughs> at least seven years after, after Charles uh, Edouard Jean Ray, meaning Le Corbusier, then died five years after Le Corbusier. That is true. Le Corbusier died in 1965 while swimming. That's why here it is written Le, Cor Le Corbusier's final swim. And Lursa died in 1970. So Lursa was not only a French modernist architect active over the same period, but also a landscape architect, furniture designer, urban planner and founding member of SIAM, SIAM being, as you know, Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne. So the, the, the series where also Le Corbusier was a founder and very involved with. His and Le Corbusier's careers were mostly parallel until the late 1920s 
when they diverge as much as it is possible for the careers of two architects to diverge. Lursa was born in Bruyere, studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Nancy, and worked in the office of Robert Malais Stevens, Stevens, Stevens. In the 20s, Lursa was in the loop and counted amongst the movers and shakers. In other words, you know, he was uh, very involved with um, the architecture of his time. His architectural ideas were very much a product of that time, and that means they were generally pretty good. Here's his uh, 1925 Maison pour uh, Monsieur Bonzel in Versailles. It still exists. So just as a reference, Villa Savoie was, uh, was born in 1928, and this was three, done three years late, uh, earlier. So this is, uh, uh, but I, I don't think I have, no, I couldn't find a picture with this Maison, but I found one from 1926 uh, Casa Guggenbull, uh, meaning uh, the you know the house, the Guggenbull house in Paris, which is this one, and you can tell it's a it's a modernist through and through. It's a modernistic house, and uh, you know the architect is uh, almost unknown. Uh, although all the issues of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, the the celebrated French architecture magazine published his works um, um, continuously, um, you know, uh, some years uh, ago, at least 50, 60 years ago. Okay, this is another house in, uh, in Boulogne. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, and I apologize, the image is not very, very satisfying, but you still have a, you get a glimpse and a Parisian double house with the two names of Maison Double de Frank Townshend and Villa Sera, on Villa Sera after the painter. He actually lived there, I think. Um, it's a little unclear to me. There is a street in Paris where he built several buildings and he even built, uh, he lived in one of the buildings and his office was across the street. So Adrian uh, Bloch tells us Lursa was responsible for number three and number four, Villa Sera, which were, uh, was his own home, as well as number five, eight, nine, and 11. Even Auguste Perret, a very important architect, did the house number seven. Anyway, uh, let's take a walk. This man who wrote this um, the article on him, uh, it's quite the enclave. Number three is Lursa's house with a boat facade, and you'll see it. Uh, it's, it's this one uh, here. And across the street, the one with a lot of green is his own office on this street with modernistic houses. Very interesting. So, you know, if the pandem pandemic goes away and if, you know, it happens that you visit Paris, maybe you'll remember this presentation and visit, uh, search for this street with modernistic houses where um, uh, André Lursa built, and not just him, also Auguste Perret, very important architect. So we saw the house, the bout house facade uh, of the, his own house and his office must have been four, uh, number four, across the road with the plants. Uh, we saw this one uh, and uh, he also built this one, number 11, on the street with the sun, uh, you know, uh, reflected by the, by the big window. Um, okay, sorry for this, but that's all I found. It is very difficult to find adequate um, uh, information about him because he's, uh, you know, not so well known, but maybe with more uh, time and, and patience, uh, some more information can be found. But I think he was a very convincing modern architect. And, uh, uh, you know, we are dealing here with buildings built almost 100 years ago. On the same period was Lursas housing in Villeneuve Saint Georges. This was featured in the Russian Constructivist Journal essay issue number six in 1927. The plans show a con concern for housing many people. This was uh, his social approach and interest in architecture. So the plans show a concern for housing many people with dignity and without wasted resources. 
he he was a, a communist, and uh, that's that's why he went uh, to Soviet Union to to work for. But at that time, uh, many intellectuals sympathized, and even Frank Lloyd Wright was not a communist. He sympathized with the with the Soviets as well. I think they were already beginning to be sick and tired of capitalism. So in 1929, unfortunately, you know, here I'm talking from a country which was communistic until 1989, and for us, communism has very bad uh, uh, and ominous uh, connotations. But the intellectuals in France had a different vision about what uh, communism was supposed to be. You know, even uh, Sartre was a communist, and uh, Picasso also, uh, although he had <laughs> riches beyond any imagining. Anyway. So André Lursa was one of the three architects, Charles de whatever, asked for a proposal to remodel his apartment on Champs-Élysées, but I only discovered this unbearably, uh, I mean, uh, you know, this, this image that is, is very difficult to, to look at, sorry. And in 1929, he designed this hotel north-sud in Corsica, is relatively well known, and it's true, it was published. It's kind of similar a little bit to the building that we saw in Vienna. It was in, included in Johnson and Hitchcock's 1932 book, The International Style. This was an honor because this Johnson, I mean, Philip Johnson and Hitchcock, um, this book, The International Style, became very well known. And if, if, if it happened to be in the pages of that book, you know, uh, was, was it meant a lot. So um, the hotel is very much the artificial object juxtaposed with nature, which depending on what you want to believe is either some contrived modernist aesthetic or precisely what to expect when you build an artificial object on a piece of rugged landscape. I personally have a problem to call a building an object, but the author of, of this text doesn't seem to have that trouble uh, or objection. Uh, anyway, he, uh, he says something about the, you know, the dining room uh, and uh, the library, but the plan is very, you know, sorry again, uh, the, on this side, uh, the images are, um, you know, s small resolution, but you, you get a feeling, you know, you see the rooms, it's a hotel and it still functions as a hotel have a corridor and then aligned uh, various rooms. But even the plants, I think, have a certain elegance. And again, the picture is not as satisfying as I would like, would have liked it to, to, to be, but I, and I apologize. I like this small picture. You, you get a feeling about Lursa, you know. He was, you know, uh, contemporary of Eduardo Toroja, uh, he was not an engineer like Toroja, but there is a level of purity in this design uh, that is, I think, to be appreciated. So in 1930, he proposed, uh, made a proposal for a vertical city, six years after Le Corbusier's La Ville Radieuse, but the solar orientations makes it very much in line with the theme of the 1930 uh, Siam Congre International d'Architecture Modern Conference, which was rational uh, lot development in terms of sunlight penetration and health. Well, <laughs> you know, a little bit hard to understand, but maybe not. You know, he oriented the buildings to get maximum of light, and um, you know, he it's, it would be interesting actually to compare this. Uh, planning to Ville Radieuse by Le Corbusier. So, you know, there was a climate where the architects were trying to better life uh, through various visions, urban or otherwise. So it wasn't just Le Corbusier, in other words. This next project is the Karl Marx Middle School in Ville Juif from 1931 to 1933. Not enclosing the guy, raising the building, I don't understand. It's normally an expensive way to shelter an entrance, but with school buildings, the additional covered outdoor space at ground level makes sense since open area isn't sacrificed to create shelter area. A little bit hard to understand, but um, if you look at the pictures, you see a typically modern, you can call it international style building, 
built 90 years ago. Um, sorry, again, it's not very easy to understand, but maybe with a little bit of effort, you see the classrooms, the big spaces, and then again, the corridor that serves them, and the courtyard towards which the, the, the classrooms open. Yes, he seems to have a liking for these long linear uh, uh, buildings with a via, very clear uh, distribution of, uh, uh, of spaces. The building is still there and still a middle school. That's nice to read. Um, so after 90 years, it still functions as a school. Along with Adolf Loss, uh, Richard Neutra, Margarete Schutelichotsky, and others, others being, as I said, Gary Riedveld and uh, Hans Hartung, very important architects. He demonstrated, uh, uh, he built a family residence at the Vienna Werkbund. We saw the first picture that I showed uh, from 1932. This is the, uh, you know, uh, you see again, uh, small pictures with a plan of a um, you know, uh, housing unit. Uh, it's actually interesting when you look, I imagine it's some kind of a duplex because uh, you, know, you have here two sleeping rooms and maybe the living room and the, and the kitchen are underneath, yes. Um, but it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, sorry about this. So this was built in Vienna. This is the other side of the building that we saw uh, uh, the first slide. You remember Werkbund Siedlung in Vienna, where it says here it was built in 19 international. It was an international, uh, uh, you know, collective, collective housing uh, built in 1932. Maybe the people at the top are the architects uh, who contributed to this uh, interesting experiment. Uh, almost as interesting as the one in Stuttgart, which is more famous, but this one also is worth uh, seeing. This colony of uh, inexpensive, um, you know, housing units where Adolf Loss built and Hans Hartung and Gary Riedveld and others. But Lursa built the biggest building there. Um, the others have uh, smaller because it, essentially this is, I mean, there are several units here. And now we see a house from 1931 and 1932, uh, produce his best known villa, Hefferlin, at Ville d'Avre. Uh, this looks rather lovely and a nice residential solution to a narrow plat and a very elegant French take on rationalism. Check out the plan. These are nice rooms. Well, where is the plan? Um, but again, you look at these images and you see that uh, Villa Savoie was not uh, alone in promoting uh, modernistic uh, uh, type of architecture at all. There were other architects who worked in the same way. Maybe some of them influenced by Le Corbusier, but it was in the air, this kind of architecture. This is also a little bit uh, similar to the villa built by Eileen Gray and Jean Badovic uh, at the Mediterranean Sea. Lursa was always on the edge of greater recognition. His buildings aimed higher than most, and some are rather good solutions to the problems he set out to solve. What happened? Why we don't know more about André Lursa? Good question. Then he went to Moscow to work for the Soviet government from 1934 to 1937, and this created a gap. And when he returned, then uh, almost immediately after he returned, the war started. So, you know, there was a gap. Here he is in, 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 uh, in the Soviet Union with, uh, you know, uh, Soviet architects, you know, the, the avant-garde of, of the Soviet Union. There was a nice spirit then, though. There were artists and architects uh, I don't know actually about 1930s, you know, I don't know why they smile so much because, you know, Stalin was already in power for a number of years and uh, uh, terror began in a way. But, the, but 
uh, Russia, at which became Soviet Union, did have exceptional artists and architects who promoted the new, and that new influence is even today. It influenced Zaha Hadid, uh, Malevich influenced her, and uh, other architects from the, the early uh, uh, part of the 20th century influenced even Bernard Chumi and others. The Russian constructivism is still a force in the field of avant-garde modern architecture and art. So we should have guessed from the plan uh, anyway that uh, now we look at it close, it's not unlike a communal house. Sorry, I, I don't know what this is. Um, uh, yeah, um, the author of this article says that just like Hans Meyer, who was the second director of the Bauhaus school, First was Walter Gropius, then Hans Meyer, and then in the end, uh, Miss van der Rohe. Hans Meyer also went to Soviet Union, just like Lursa in 1933. So Lursa left the Soviet Union. Uh, he built there uh, probably some apartment buildings, but I couldn't find pictures with them. He left the Soviet Union in 1937. The same year, Frank Lloyd Wright addressed the first Soviet Council of Architects at the height of Stalin's great terror. So it's very interesting, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, the, the, uh, the, the American architect par excellence, gave a talk to the first Soviet Council. The Frenchman, André Lursa, went to, 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 to Soviet Union and worked there for three, four years. Hans Meyer, the German architect, also went to... So the, the, and I'm asking myself, why? Why do, did these people, so different from each other, why were they seduced by the ideology and the promise of Soviet Union? Well, they didn't know. They didn't know how communism was supposed to, to function and to be implemented, but they had a desire for the new, for a new man, so to speak. They, they, they wanted to escape, you know, the mercantilism of capitalism and they wanted to, you know, to, they had social concerns, they loved democracy, but a uh, real democracy, not a mimic democracy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Soviet Union, we know very well what it became. But in those years, uh, uh, there was still some kind of a hope that uh, uh, a new kind of society could, could, could happen that would work uh, in accordance with the dreams and idealism of, of these um, you know, uh, artists and architects. So Lursa is known for advancing the cause of modernism in landscape architecture. He took a position contrary to the proponents of existence minimum. So minimal exist, the, the, the word in German existence minimum refers to that minimal architecture that Neufer advocated and, you know, some, um, you know, maybe many architects immediately after the Second World War that all social housing must include gardens. So this is very interesting. So Lursa, who was an architect, also understood the importance of gardens. And you'll see now a few houses by him where he didn't neglect what was outside of the house, meaning the garden. In retrospect, we can see this interest in the 1925 Maison pour, for Monsieur Bomsel. Is that very house that I couldn't find? but it, uh, it's, it's here. The garden is carefully laid out as if it wanted to be a vegetable garden. Now, <laughs> these, uh, these drawings seem to be a little abstract. You don't know exactly what's going on here, but whatever it is, I like the image, I like the graphics, and let's imagine it's some kind of a creative uh, garden. We see a picture which kind of doesn't quite match what we saw before, maybe the, the the, the previous picture, although they were shown in conjunction, the two of them. Anyway, the idea, and we shouldn't dwell too much on details, uh, the, the idea that I think is worth uh, underlining and, and, and defending is that, and especially for our time, that uh, gardens are extremely important. Nature is very important. And maybe we could start a project these days where we do first the garden and then we do the house to match the garden and not the other way around. I guess the drawing that we saw previously refers to this um, portion of the garden. 
because I see the, the diagonals. Maybe, maybe somewhere here or in reverse or this one. I'm a little bit confused, but uh, the idea again to, 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 to pay attention to, to the green outside of the house uh, is, is I think a valid one and especially today. He's also known for his planned post-war reconstruction of the French city of Maubeuge, Maubeuge just north of Paris. Uh, he was a professor at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratives and the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Beaux Arts in Paris from 1945 to 1947 and a member of the Board of Architecture of the Ministry of Reconstruction and Ur Urban Development. So it was immediately after the Second World War when many people didn't have homes. So some architects devoted themselves to build, um, you know, houses that were inexpensive and very necessary. There was an unsurprising gap between 1937 when Lursar returned from the Soviet Union and the 94 master plan for this uh, city that uh, I mentioned. Lursa did not work for the 1944-1944 Vichy government as Le Corbusier did. Lursa's appointment to the Ministry of Reconstruction and Urban Development shows a desire to be of use. And uh, I found these images again, uh, uh, the sorry for the resolution, uh, I couldn't find the higher resolutions, but you can tell even from afar that uh, uh, there was a concern with reconstruction and not necessarily in um, idealized or flamboyant aesthetical terms, but to build uh, uh, quickly uh, much needed, uh, you know, blocks of flats and uh, apartment houses and so on. There are many other photos of the reconstructed Maubeuge uh, uh, on, on which also worked, um, you know, the lover of Eileen Gray, the Romanian uh, Jean Badovic. He also built a few blocks of flats there on the town's tourism website. It's the type of low rise, high density housing Europe needed immediately after the war. So he kind of gave away, um, you know, uh, being part of the aesthetical avant-garde. And here he became the social worker that uh, Europe needed at that time. You see, uh, they don't impress us such buildings, but, but then uh, late forties, you know, they provided luminous, decent, healthy, uh, you know, apartments for, for, for many people. And you could say, wait a minute, this is kind of an anonymous architecture, it's not great architecture. It is true. Maybe it's not a great architecture. But what is a great architecture? I mean, yes, this is not a temple, this is not a church, this is not, you know, uh, Fondation Louis Vuitton, it's not uh, the Guggenheim Museum. But these buildings were necessary and were built by sensitive architects, and André Lursa was one of them in France at that time. Here and there you can see the, <laughs> you know, the artist in the architect had to manifest himself, which is okay. Uh, and, um, you know, th there is a place for anyone, I think. Uh, so Lyusa's next known work is a house that he built for himself in 1948 in Seoul, about midway between Paris and Orly. So very close to, to Paris. You know, it's the same kind of aesthetics, you know, uh, maybe the, he was influenced by some uh, ideas in uh, and the ideologies uh, that he, enc he encountered in, in the Soviet Union, an architecture without uh, great uh, ego ambitions, but that is not necessarily bad. Inside, as you can see, is, is, is very pleasant and, and uh, you know, comfortable, it looks comfortable. And these are the plans. It's not the biggest house on earth, nor the smallest. And he built it for himself. Less spectacular, of course, much less spectacular than, let's say, Villa Savoie. But, uh, you know, he didn't have that uh, I, I intention that Le Corbusier had. And he built it for himself. It's adjacent to one another house he designed for a neighbor, Jules Le Duc, 
Lursa never let go of the importance of gardens. Again, this is a, an important um, uh, point, I think. So uh, again, he paid attention to gardens, and I think we should pay at ourselves attention to attention to garden these days, or gardens. Now, the, the aesthetics were kind of influenced, or there is a parallelism between this kind of, uh, you know, uh, rationalism, and uh, he mentions here the Cesare Cataneo, Italian architect from 1939. Uh, this, the author of this article, uh, whose name I couldn't find, but what's written here is not by me. It makes me think Lursa, like the, the Italians, found no reason to abandon rationalism as a way of building. This is the building built by this uh, Italian in Italy, Cesare Cataneo, from 1939, and this is what he himself built um, uh, late 40s in France. So here he built an interesting church in 1958. So he was approaching, well, he was about 60 uh, something, uh, L'Eglise Saint-Pierre, uh, the church uh, Saint Peter and Saint Paul in Maubeuge in the same uh, town where he did those uh, social housing. Uh, not bad, it's, um, you know, uh, it's not a bad building. And it is indeed a, a church, you know, as opposed to the blocks of flats. And some other pictures of this church. Uh, so he, he was able to handle many, many programs. And if I am to remember something about him is this fact that he paid a lot of attention to gardens. I didn't have too many images to, to, to show this and to emphasize this, but I trust the author of this article that indeed Lursa was not indifferent at all to gardens. And maybe we see some kind of a connection with uh, an impossible connection with Francois Roche, L'Enfant Terrible of Contemporary Architecture, because you saw that, let's call it house in Paris, which is actually a, a mound of greenery. The church again. Um, and here you see a, a mosaic uh, you know, ceramic uh, work, you know, an artistic, uh, you know, uh, work, part of this church where you see his name and I imagine he created it in 1958. And it's interesting, this uh, entrance into the church, you know, with these scribblings, you know, done with mosaic. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's ceramic. And now to, 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 uh, finalize our trip, you know, we go back to the very beginning. So we end where we began. We remember that house of that Spanish architect that he built where he used ceramic tiles. Here we have uh, mosaics, also little pieces of ceramics with which he illustrates in a figurative way various themes I, I imagine connected with, um, you know, with, with religion. And this is the man we saw already this picture and another picture with him. And uh, anyway, this that's it. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore you today. If you are still here. Ah, yes, thank you. A few people are still here. Thank you very much. So- You're pretty welcome.